Hey Starship Addicts, my name is Zach Golden, and welcome to another CSI Starbase Special Report. As you can probably guess by the title of this episode, today we are going to be analyzing some of the damage that occurred after Ship 24's recent six-engine static fire test. I'm sure by now most of you have seen the damage tiles and videos of the subsequent brush fire that occurred immediately after the test. There were a lot of details about this event, however, that weren't so easy to notice. In particular, the damage sustained to the pad and also what I believe might be the source of the damage to a majority of the heat shield tiles. At the end of this, you will probably find yourself wondering, is the new version of Starship with the Raptor 2s now too powerful for the suborbital test stands? Let's review all the facts and then I'll let you be the judge. Welcome to CSI Starbase. First things first, let's address the fires after the fire. I said fires in plural form because although the one we saw from the sinks engine static fire was pretty severe, it wasn't the first time this has happened. This title actually belongs to Starhopper's glorious 500 foot hop test in July of 2019. This was sparked while Hoppy was coming in for its incredible landing. A few minutes after the successful touchdown, you could see the fire beginning to develop off screen. This was the first time SpaceX was in the news for a brush fire at their Texas facility. Fast forwarding three years later, during Ship 24's first two engine static fire test, which appeared to go off without a hitch, there was a small grass fire visible after all of the smoke cleared. The fire was located right next to the driveway that leads up to suborbital pad B. The best vantage point for this was Lab Padre's Raptor Roost camera, which had a perfect angle of the backside of the test stand. Luckily, this one didn't last too long, probably as a result of the significant amount of water that drenched most of the vegetation on this side of the pad. When the small pre-static fire water deluge system activates nearly 30 seconds before ignition, a lot of the water falls off to the side of the driveway. That isn't enough to protect the grass in this direction, however, because the water seems to only travel downhill towards the area which used to be the landing pad. This was a bit concerning to me, especially since during the two engine test, I noticed that a piece of red hot burning material was ejected over the berm right as the engines were beginning to shut down. It ended up landing nearby the suborbital tank farm. This didn't cause any issues, however, because SpaceX had spent nearly a month clearing out all of the vegetation in order to create a bit of a buffer zone between the flames and the grassland area. One thing to note is this sliver of land in between the two clear patches, which still has some flammable plant material present at the time. The reason this is here is because this land is actually considered part of the existing high marsh habitat. Although this area is within the future expansion zone planned by SpaceX, I don't think they're currently able to develop anything outside of the area that has currently been cleared. I believe this is considered part of the protected wetland area and requires approval from the Army Corps of Engineers, which as of yet has not been granted. Part of the reason these rules are important is because this entire basin, like many others, is designed to withstand a 100 year storm. This means if SpaceX were to fill in this area with dirt, they would have to remove the exact same amount of dirt in another location in order to maintain the total volume capacity of the flood basin. Because of this situation, when it came time to do the six engine static fire test, I was assuming there might be a fire right here because there is no berm to protect the flames from shooting straight out and licking the grass. Turns out that's not the only place it started. As you can see in the replay, there are actually two separate fires. One started way over on the left, while the other is seen near the middle of the screen. Now that's pretty crazy considering the flames didn't actually travel that far. So there must have been some burning material flying through the air. If you follow CSI Starbase on Twitter, then you probably have seen the two initiation points of the fire already from the aerial view. Once the fire got started, it quickly began to pick up a lot of energy. Because Ship 24 needed to complete its detank and be fully safed before the road could open again, the fire continued to burn late into the night. Once the road finally opened, crews began setting back burn fires ahead of the main front. This allowed them to prevent the fire from growing in size, which could allow it to jump over the highway in the areas shown here. When all was said and done, this is the area that was burned. Watching the aftermath of this test as it developed definitely reinvigorated some of the discussions related to the environmental impact of the Starship program operating out of this South Texas launch complex. Fortunately, I don't have to go too deep into this one because Eric Ralph from Teslarati has already done the legwork for us. Long story short, according to the program environmental assessment, fires of this nature are basically expected to occur from time to time, and to some degree, it's partially encouraged. Take that for what it is. If you would like to read the full text, you can find the link to this tweet in the description. All right, let's back up just a little bit. 
After the two-engine test, SpaceX began preparing for the real deal, a six-engine static fire test, but first, one of the three RVAC engines had to be replaced. Every time these engines are swapped out, we find ourselves wondering why? What was the problem? Well, luckily this time around, we were able to get some pretty detailed shots of it thanks to Mauricio from RGV Aerial Photography. As I was examining this photo during one of the Starbase weekly live streams, I noticed this hole in one of the methane pipes that comes from the top of the engine bell and passes through the thermal protection barrier. If you were there for this episode or happen to follow CSI Starbase on Twitter as I mentioned earlier, then you have probably seen the damage that occurred to this pipe. In response to this tweet, several folks like this fellow by the name of Eric is on Twitter have commented that this appears it could have been a ruptured pipe due to an overpressure event inside of it causing it to burst. Now, this could be true, but I think we should also leave open the option that it could have been caused by debris from the pad bouncing up and hitting the pipe. This wouldn't be the first time that it happened either. Just ask Lab Padre's launch pad cam. This footage was taken during one of SN10's static fire tests last year. When we slow it down, you can see the individual pieces of Martite before they slam into the metal shipping container. Returning to Ship 24's two-engine static fire, after it was over, I got the feeling that SpaceX probably noticed some of the same debris flying through the air as well. If not, then there was probably some actual damage to the concrete underneath the suborbital stand, because shortly after the static fire test, they began performing some upgrades to the pad. Not only did they install better flame diverters around the six vertical legs, but they also poured a new concrete pad underneath the test stand. You can see it from the aerial view pretty well. Also note that this pad is roughly 18 inches thick. We can tell this by looking at the relative heights of the top of the worker's hard hats when we compare the before and after ground pictures. The pad is so thick, in fact, that they had to pour an additional ramp in order to allow the Raptor maintenance truck to be able to drive up underneath the stand when swapping out engines. Another thing to note is that the concrete directly underneath the test stand and the inclined ramp are two different colors. The difference we are seeing here is likely due to the concrete underneath the pad being treated with an additive that drastically improves its resistance to flame and blast damage. Both of the hexagonal rings that make up the two-layered ramp appear to be regular old concrete just like the rest of the driveway. As soon as I saw this for the first time, I was a bit confused why the entire thing wasn't poured using the same mixture. Using these models from 3D forensics agent Chameleon Circuit, we can better visualize the point I'm trying to make here. In a single engine static fire test, the lone exhaust plume has the freedom to spread out in every direction. Some bounces back up, but the majority goes out to either side. Because this test stand is a six-sided shape, this means that about one-sixth of the total exhaust flow will be directed outward between each of the legs. When you have all six engines firing at the same time, then you basically have one full Raptor engine worth of exhaust plumes coming from each side of the test stand. I know that some of you probably don't think that the RVAC plumes would be cone-shaped like this, but it would explain the little triangular cap placed on top of the flame diverters. Anyways, with that being said, the first thing I looked for when watching the static fire was signs of concrete actively being vaporized. I looked through almost every available view, slowing the footage down and zooming in on different parts of the exhaust cloud and also on the ground, but sadly, I wasn't able to find anything conclusive. Well, at least until I remembered to check Lab Padre's Raptor Roost camera, and that's when I saw it. When you view this footage for the first time, you might not catch it. My first reaction was this might just be a flock of birds fleeing the area. There are a few birds flying across the water, but most of the white specks we are seeing appear to be stationary, so that can't be what we're seeing. Another option could be fish jumping out of the shallow water as shockwaves from the raptors travel through the water causing them to get scared. But I don't think that's the case here either. What we're seeing actually is debris from the static fire falling from the sky and splashing down into the water for a very long time. So long, in fact, that I had a hard time believing it until I considered how high in the air this cloud of dust from the static fire actually traveled. When we compare it to the two-engine static fire, you can really get an appreciation for it. The debris cloud travels so high that it's actually taller than the orbital launch integration tower, which is insane. I think this might also be one of the first times we have ever been able to really see one of these berms at Starbase do its job. As soon as the plume reaches the berm, it gets sent into the air at nearly a 45 degree angle, which allows it to clear the tank farm. The morning after the test, Mauricio from RGV Aerials traveled out to the launch site and took a massive amount of photos, which allowed us to be able to verify that we weren't just imagining this hailstorm of gravel. The evidence for this is literally everywhere. Let's just start with looking at the concrete underneath the pad. For reference, this is what it looked like the previous week when Starship Gazer took a nice picture of it a few days after the new concrete was laid. 
As you can tell, it was nice and smooth. Now check this out. Yikes. It looks like this concrete experienced 200 years of weathering in less than eight seconds. Looking at the berm behind pad B, you can see these concrete pebbles in various locations. You can see it even more on the edge of the pad where it was washed away by the water as the engines began to power down. This is what it looked like the previous week. You can see that the berm was much cleaner looking as far as not having any partially disintegrated concrete shrapnel scattered all over it goes. Looking towards the wetlands, unfortunately it appears we can see it out there as well, but it's hard to tell what was here before and after the event. Let's check out the aerial view again to see exactly how far away the debris would have needed to travel in order for me to be able to notice it on Raptor Roost Cam. Looking at Google Maps, we can see the general direction of Raptor Roost and draw a straight line from there to the suborbital pad. Now duplicate that line on this image, which was taken during the flyover on the day of the static fire. This is actually just a few hours before it happened, so you can see where the water levels were on the day of the incident. If we look at the footage one more time, it seems like the location where we observed the debris falling into the water would have to be way over in this area. I'm not going to bother trying to determine exactly how far it went, but I think it's safe to say it was several hundred yards. So if the ship was sending debris that far and didn't get noticed by rover cam, then it must have all been traveling in the opposite direction. This means that the wind was blowing back towards the belly of the ship. When we look at Sapphire cam, you can confirm this as well. The huge debris cloud almost immediately starts moving back towards the ship after it exits from under the test stand. Once the test was over, I immediately decided to count the missing tiles in order to determine how bad the damage was in comparison to past tests. With the help from one of the CSI Starbase 3D forensics agents, we were able to confirm roughly 30 damaged tiles, and then I posted the results on Twitter. Right away, I went back to analyzing the damage. What bothered me about this test was the fact that the flaps were extended. When Ship 20 performed its six engine static fire last year, the flaps were folded into their storage position. As a result, there was zero damage on the flaps after the test concluded. All of the missing tiles were instead located on the body of the ship. Returning to the present day, you can see pretty clearly that the tiles on the bottom of Ship 24's flaps appear to have taken significant amount of direct impacts from either the vaporized concrete or the actual Raptor engine exhaust. At the same time I came to this realization, Elon Musk happened to respond to my tweet saying this is why they do static fire tests and that it's much better to break things on the ground than en route to orbit. As a follow-up question, I really wanted to ask Elon why they performed the test with the flaps extended if the Starship is never going to end up in a situation where the flaps are exposed to a rebounding debris plume like this. But I figured the reason probably had something to do with the location of the Raptor chill vents and wanting to keep as much airflow over them as possible. What you're seeing here is actually footage of Starship 20 during one of its cryo tests. On Ship 24, the vents are actually moved even closer to the flaps, so this kind of makes sense to have them open. But speaking of breaking things, here's another interesting observation that you probably might have missed. All over the suborbital and orbital test stands, there are various cameras in all kinds of cool spots so that SpaceX can analyze every single detail of the action, similar to how I'm doing right now, except with way more angles. There are a few angles in particular that I wish I had access to in order to answer some of the remaining questions that I have in my head right now. For starters, I would love to have the footage from the drone that took this image, which was super close to the action. You can actually see it right here in the Lab Padre rover cam footage. Even better than this drone shot, however, would probably be this camera right here, which probably captured the whole thing at a super high frame rate. But the best view in the entire house would have to be these cameras right here. They're located on the legs of the suborbital stand and probably have a pretty incredible upskirt view that looks similar to this. I would love to see how all of the shielding held up during this test and whether or not there were any debris flying up there causing damage. The only problem is I'm not sure how much of this footage actually exists from that test. I guess that really depends on how long it took for the RVAC engines to vaporize the cameras. Vaporizing might be a bit of an exaggeration here, but if you look closely, you can see that all three of these cameras had their careers unexpectedly cut short thanks to this eight second six engine static fire. We know they weren't completely vaporized, however, because oddly enough, one of these cameras was actually recovered by Mauricio as he was doing his typical round trip at Starbase to gather images for our Starbase weekly live stream. Thanks to these images, we can see the damage sustained to these alleged blast-proof cameras. As you can see, the protective glass lens is completely shattered, but other than that, the enclosure appears to have held up pretty well. The interesting part is where this was found. From what we can gather, this 5-10 to 10 pound camera was blasted free from its mount and ended up rolling all the way over to this area shown in this image. Luckily, the loss of a camera like this isn't too serious and won't take SpaceX long to replace. 
In my opinion, it's looking like pad B will need another upgrade to the concrete ramp on the outer edges so that they are formed using the same Martite blend as the area in the center of the pad before they decide to do any more six engine static fires on this suborbital test stand. One thing we can be sure of is that when SpaceX builds these suborbital test stands for pad 39A, they will probably look much different than this. By doubling the height of the test stand and installing a more adequate deluge system, I think a lot of the issues that we see here could be easily avoided. As for the existing test stands, I think it would be difficult to increase the height without completely redesigning the frame. One option would be to put an adapter on top similar to the one used for Booster 3 static fire, except two or three times taller. The problem with that is, if they decided to do this, they would lose the ability to swap out engines using the Raptor maintenance truck. Of course, they could use the Orbital Launch Mount Raptor maintenance stand, however, it would not be able to get underneath the deck of the first level platform. As you can see, it's taller than the entire test stand. So basically, the entire suborbital stand would need to be redesigned in order to accomplish this. It's important to note that everything stated here during this episode is just my opinion based on observations that I've made after viewing the evidence that I've put before you here today. Feel free to leave your counter arguments in the comments section. Hopefully you enjoyed today's Starship Damage Report. If so, don't forget to hit that like button and also make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If this is your first CSI Starbase experience, then I highly recommend going back to watch one of these two videos to get yourself caught up before the next deep dive investigation comes out. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so by becoming a monthly member on Patreon, where you can also get access to the CSI Starbase Discord server. Thanks to all of the YouTube members, monthly supporters on Patreon, and everyone else who has donated via PayPal towards the new camera fund since the last episode. With that, I really need to get back to recording the next two deep dive investigations. Wait, before you go, there is one thing I forgot to mention. I know some of you may be thinking, it seems like most of this damage to Ship 24 is largely cosmetic, but I have a bit of speculation for you based on these images posted by Starship Gazer on Twitter. As you can see here, late last week after the static fire tests, crews attached this scaffolding platform underneath the payload door on Ship 24. While Gazer was observing work on the Starship, he spotted this odd looking bracket being installed on the side of the sliding doorway. This bracket slides underneath the vertical stringers and should add additional strength to the doorway. A few days later, Mauricio from RGV Aerial Photography got even more shots of the additional bracing being added around the entire perimeter of the payload bay opening. The reason I didn't include this in the main part of this episode is because this is still a developing investigation. But I have a feeling Ship 24 may have suffered some unseen structural damage during the static fire test. It looks like this investigation isn't over yet. Be on the lookout for updates once more information becomes available. Until then, Stage Zero Zach, signing off.